Gastronomie wirklich mehr als Neoklassik mit gesundem Menschenverstand? Über all das ähm, wollen wir zunächst von David Halpern äh, etwas hören. David Halpern ist gelernter Psychologe und er ist Chiefs, Chief Executive äh, des Behavioral Insight Teams in London. Das Team wurde gegründet, ist auch als Nudge Team bekannt, wurde gegründet ähm, unter der Regierung von David Cameron ähm, und ist heute ein Teil privatisierter Spin-off, der sich mit Politikberatung befasst. David Halpern hat auch schon Tony Blair beraten. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to apologize for speaking in uh, English. It's a failure of our educational system. Um, so um, I'm going to go through and give you some sense of what we've been doing. Um, and for those who want to kind of catch up, um, I should also say partly you can also read about what we've been doing. Um, we've tried to be very open and public, and we think that governments that want to use these approaches actually need to be quite open about what they're doing. But let me just jump straight in with a nice sort of simple example, a non-economic one on the face of it, um, to illustrate the kind of things that we're wrestling with. I mean, you get, I used to be a respectable academic in years gone by, at uh, Cambridge actually, before I was drawn into the Downing Street of, of, of Tony Blair, in fact, uh, for six years. Um, and often we'd list, go to, you know, the, the seminars of my economics colleagues, and they would start the seminar with, so we're going to make a set of assumptions like everybody's got perfect information and so on and so on and so on. And you think, well, they're obviously ridiculous assumptions and everyone knew it, but it didn't really matter. It didn't seem like it mattered perhaps because on average, the model would still work. I think what we found in 2008, many of us, and certainly in British government, there was a very strong sense of this, is that our models were really built on sand and that some of those assumptions turned out to be extremely problematic. And if we were really going to get this right and not have the same problems, we would have to go back to basics and really build models on more sensible assumptions. So let me explain this simple example as if just to make the point, really. This is suicide rates in the UK. And you can see something really remarkable happened um, in this sort of period from the mid-50s to early 1970s. The suicide rates dropped very dramatically in the UK. I think you'll find they didn't do that in Germany for reasons that become obvious. And they fell year on year and you, until you can see about a, a 20, 25% plus fall for both men and women. And people were fascinated about this. What was going on? What was happening? Was it the rise of free love or everybody had somehow got you know, nicer to each other or the world was better? Um, actually, we know that's not what happened. What happened was the discovery of North Sea oil those who don't know this story. Um, now, why would North Sea oil lead to this dramatic reduction in the suicide rate? Well, the reason is because the way that, one of the most popular ways of killing yourself in Britain at the time was that you'd put your head in the oven. You'd literally put your head in the oven, don't turn it on, just let the gas go, and this would kill you. Now, the reason why it would kill you is that gas was derived from coal, which had lots of carbon monoxide. So you would die from carbon monoxide poisoning. When oil was discovered in the North Sea, we had then natural gas, which doesn't have much carbon monoxide. So, what happens? This is, um, you can see, these are suicide rates from um, carbon monoxide. You can see them dropping spectacularly, but you see very little movement in suicide rates from other causes. Now, this is not a small issue in life, you would think, where you're going to be rationally um, hopefully utility maximizing as to whether to end your own life. Now, economists may handle the issue, of course, with, well, people have different preferences, which might be also to end your life, but how remarkable that just this extra little bit of friction in terms of your head in the oven wouldn't work any well. People would literally give up and then, okay, well, I won't kill myself then. I'll go on with life. It's a glimpse into a world of real human beings and how we make decisions as opposed to the assumptions which our models have often been based. So in the wake of um, the 2008 and of course the, the 2010 election for us, um, Prime Minister Cameron and indeed the Deputy Prime Minister, it was a coalition government, said, well, let's try this out. And we set up in Downing Street a very small unit. Um, I returned, I thought I'd done my time in Downing Street, I should say. I came back to work with Cameron. And we were set up this so-called nudge unit, this skunk work 
of just six, seven people, and we would see, well, what happens if we try to design policy on the basis of real human behavior? And in the coalition agreement, there was this phrase, in fact, to try and encapsulate it. Find intelligent ways to encourage, support, and enable people to make better choices for themselves. But actually, it was a sort of cover for trying to introduce a more realistic model of human behavior. Um, and the other thing that slides alongside it is that we didn't have much money, and we didn't want to regulate lots. So two approaches, really, that it brought in. First of all, let's try and introduce a more realistic model of human behavior. Now, you had quite a bit of theory, so I didn't want to do lots today. So I'm going to try and summarize the entire behavioral economics literature um, with one piece of paper, which is slightly ambitious, I know. But let's, let's just try. If I take this piece of paper and I tear it in half, um, Danny Kahneman's work known of thinking fast, thinking slow, and I'll try and illustrate it with this piece of paper. I'm going to need a volunteer who's ready with this half. I need someone whose hands are free. Are you ready? Oh, look, you're, you're looking ready. Can you just put your phone down for a second? You ready? Okay, here we go. Very good, thank you. You see that? The gentleman, the professor, in fact, caught the piece of paper. So why is that so interesting? Because if we say, well, how did you do that? You'll say, well, I just put my hands up. It was simple. It's not simple at all. It's an extraordinarily complicated set of things that happened to try and estimate how big this thing, how heavy it is, what its arc is in space, when it's in fact ambiguous in a mathematical sense, to then also um, basically move your hands in the perfect moment to intercept this piece of paper. It's a phenomenally complicated thing, which no computer or machine learning program has yet able to do even in Germany, as far as I can tell. But we think nothing of it. It's the kind of thing that humans do fast. Their brains do very fast, very complicated calculations. But if we take the other half of this piece of paper, and we say, well, let's fold it in half. I used to do this with my students at Cambridge. And say, so I fold it once, and I fold it twice. I'm not going to make anything very pretty, I'm afraid. And imagine I could carry on folding it. Right? And so I fold it four times, you know, blah, blah, blah. I could fold it, let's suppose, 100 times. You can see, in practice, that's quite difficult, right? So I would say, well, how thick does this piece of paper end up? Not a complicated calculation. See, very high. Any rough estimates? Extraordinarily high. Yes, indeed, you're correct. So my students would say, oh, it must be really high, like as high as this room, or maybe as high as the moon. You know? Of course, exactly. It's billions of light years. Exactly. Thank you. A very clever audience. So. Um, it's literally billions of, I mean, a rough estimate would be 10 times the width of the entire Milky Way. Most people are not very good at this calculation, which is a simple thing which you can do in a few moments on a calculator, thinking slow rather than thinking fast. So the point about it is, if we're going to build policy, we should try and build it around what humans are good at and what we're not good at, right? And they are very, very discrepant. The other element, which I'll just briefly explain, which is equally radical in its own way, is that we brought with it a kind of humility. That phrase was used, actually, um, in one of the presentations this morning about modesty, which is to say human beings are really complicated. We're not very good at predicting what they'll do. So why do we try? Why don't we try out alternatives and figure out what works more effectively? And maybe if we come back to it, it's an interesting question constitutionally as to whether you can do that in the German context. So let me just show you then some basic applications once you've got the gist of it. And then what I'll do in the second bit is I'm going to go through some slightly more advanced models. I'm going to go through them quite fast, I'm afraid. Here's a very simple old example. It's not we've never done this before. When cars started appearing, um, particularly in the, from 1910 to 1920 and through the 20s, these newfangled automobiles um, would keep hitting each other. And um, someone had the bright idea. This, in fact, was in 1919 in Dead Man's Corner in America. Well, these cars particularly were hitting each other. Why don't we just paint a line? You can literally see down the middle of the road and a big arrow. Here's a good idea. Why don't you drive on that side versus the other? And essentially, codify a habit. Now, you could have used other instruments. You could have said, let's have economic sanctions to punish people who take too long. Or we could say, let's have some stronger laws. We could do all those kinds of things. But in fact, it just becomes codified as a social norm. And it's a matter of genius that the economy works. You can come through, you can move things through the economy and people relatively safely, because essentially we adopt a series of kind of codified rules. Am I clicking a bit? Um, OK. Um, and that's still true today. Other examples, let me just quickly go through some simple ones. Well, one is we often use economic instruments to encourage people to do things. In the UK, a major one, and many Anglo-Saxon countries, 
is to use tax subsidies to encourage good things. In this case, getting people to pay the, um, to save for their pensions. And this was, we spend, you know, 20 odd billion, 30 billion a year in tax subsidies in the UK, um, for example. The question was, maybe Anglo-Saxons just don't like saving. In 2012, we simply changed the default. So we said, instead of you having to opt in to your pension, you still have the choice, but you opt out if you don't want to be a part of it. Starts in 2012. This is what happens to pensions rate. Amongst those who are eligible, it's more than 90%, some workers aren't eligible, um, who stay in this. Um, what's the relative cost effectiveness, by the way, of a tax subsidy, our best estimate? For every extra pound, every extra euro, we get one P, one cent of extra saving. Incredibly ineffective, whereas simply changing the default has brought in the UK alone, and we haven't still finished rolling it out, more than five million new savers since 2012. Um, here's another simple example. I have no idea if it's the same in Germany, but in Britain we're quite good at inventing new sort of extra subsidies for businesses. We'll give you this extra money to do something good. And often no one can quite remember what they all are. Here was a big new launch for a program, some extra money for businesses to get advice. This was the launch, and this was the take-up of businesses. And you can see it wasn't that great. Um, so we said, can we just try something out? So this is what I'll just show you what happens to the data. So all we did is we realized, well, government's already communicating with businesses all the time through tax. Why don't we just mention in a few of these emails that there's this new <laughs> this, uh, bonus, this subsidy available, and you can see what happens. So nearly all of the, um, the take-up for this particular uh, subsidy, essentially, for businesses is driven by when we happen to mention using an existing channel. Whereas spending tens of millions through conventional campaigns did pretty much nothing. It's not complicated. Um, here's an example which starts to illustrate the experimentation side. So, um, again, I'm sure this never happens in Germany, but in Britain, occasionally people don't pay their taxes on time. Um, so we just took a block of unpaid tax, 600 million, a billion euros, and we said, well, let's simplify the letters. So the, simple, the letters were already simplified, unusually simple, actually. It had already been done, and we thought, well, maybe is there any wording you can use to improve it still further? So we would just try adding one line, just vary the letter and see if it makes a difference. So in this case, we add this one line. You see all it's, that's all it says. It says something that's true. It just says to people, nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time. It's a social norm. We're very influenced by what other people are doing. Would it make a difference? Well, there's our control group with a nice simplified letter. And you can see this is payment within 23 days. So we use the existing data infrastructure of our revenue service. Adding the one line. Well, actually, yes, it does. Now, that might not look a lot to you, but when you're the revenue service and you find that you can add one line at no marginal cost and get an extra percentage point or two, that's really worth waking up about. Even more influence, generally, than people in general. You'll be especially influenced by those who are like you. So, in fact, we also tried to say, well, what happens if we just say, most people in your area, Derek, pay their tax on time? Um, well, that works even better. By the way, we checked it was true. If we flip it around and we say, you're one of the few people who've yet to pay your tax on time, even better. And if we say most people in your area pay their tax on time, you're one of the few who've yet to do so, now we're at five percentage point increase. <laughs> Why I show you this is because I think in the German context, you're at this point where the Chancery clearly has started to say, we're going to set up a team like this, but they haven't had the results. We have similar skepticism in the UK, but as these kind of results came in, people start to very rapidly change their mind and say, well, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we try to vary our letters to make them more effective? Um, here's another example, uh, an employment one. So in our job centers, as we call them, if you're unemployed, you have to turn up, and this is where you make sure you're looking for work. One of the things we just noticed, this, I show you this example to illustrate the humanity of it, I think, is that when people were um, told that you've you know, we've got uh, arranged for you to have a job interview at, on Saturday, because there's a big supermarket, it's recruiting, if you go along, you've got a place. They would get a text on their phones, but only one in 10 would actually turn up. Well, what happens if we just change the text? What happens if we add someone's name, right? So we'd said, Dirk, you'd get your text, and just have your name on the beginning. Well, that already brings it up 50%, five percentage point. By the way, if I add my name as the advisor, Dirk, blah, 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 David, now I'm at 18%. If we add one other line, just to humanize it a little bit, where we say, Dirk, I've booked you a place, blah, 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 blah. Good luck, David. Now, nearly a third are turning up. 
It's also how do you feel? It's just a nicer way of having an exchange with government. Um, here's another example which I think illustrates a different class of problems, which is also how important you know, <laughs> this stuff is. So we noticed there was an issue um, with the recruitment in the um, particularly ethnic minorities in much lower rates. So this is in the police. And so because it was such an issue, the, this is the white scores on this exam, the Home Office made the exam online. So it wouldn't be marked by human beings who are prone to prejudice. And yet still, this is the marks of the ethnic minorities. And this, by the way, translated into a pass rate of 60%, and this a pass rate of 40%. So there's lots of theories about why this was. Maybe mastery of English, etc. Well, maybe. Let's just try one thing. So imagine you're this candidate. You receive an email saying it's time to do the exam. So we add one line again onto this email, and it just says, before you take this test, just take a few moments to think about why it was important to you and your community to join the police. This is joining the police. Randomized control trial. You can see it doesn't do anything for the white applicants. For the ethnic minority applicants, it hugely boosts their um, performance. And because of the thresholds, it moves the pass rate from 40% to 60%. Essentially eliminates the difference. This stuff, this detail is so consequential for how we respond. It's true for how we teach our kids, right? Whether it's a parent or indeed as a, as a teacher, how, what we say back to them, how we say it. So a very simple encapsulation of this stuff before we move on to the second half. It's not very complicated, but we use it. You may find it helpful. East, it's a mnemonic, East. Easy, be obsessed with frictional costs. A, attractive. In human terms, how do we make something more or less attractive? For example, we're very attuned to relativities, but not absolutes. Social, we're incredibly influenced by what other people are doing, and timely. There are a lot of things which will work at some times and won't work at all in others. If you want people to move to public transport, even doing face-to-face -face interviews generally won't do very much unless they've just moved house. If they've just moved house, extremely effective to drive movement from one side to the other. We tend not to think about laws like that. We think, well, they apply all the time to everyone in an even way, but of course that's not true for human beings. So going deeper, let me just give you a sense then, maybe picking up on some of the theoretical issues we heard this morning about where it might take you, as opposed to these very nuts and bolts examples, of which we have many hundred now. So here's another employment example. In common with um, many parts of Northern Europe, we have run what we call active welfare policies. And what this means is that you have to go to a job center, and you have to show that you're looking for work, often because we don't really trust you, if we're honest about it. And you have to go in there in the British system, and you have to show, they'll say, well, what jobs did you look for last week? Now, this is more than changing wording on the letter, because we have to change the behavior of the advisor in this case, you'll see. So we had a hypothesis. There were lots of things wrong with this, about saying, what did you do last week? First of all, anchors you to three results. Why three and not more? Um, but most of all, it's asking you about what you did last week. There's a whole body of literature suggesting if you ask people when, what, how, they're much more likely. So we changed to, to, to do something. So we changed it, in essence, to say to the advisors, don't ask about last week, ask about next week. And ask in specific ways. So if I can pick on Dirk again, if you don't mind, I'll say, what kind of work are you looking for? And he'll say, I want to be a CEO, whatever it would be. And so, but I say then, um, well, how are you going to? You're very busy. Next week, what time? When will you do it? And you might say, Tuesday, is that Tuesday? So we say, well, when on Tuesday? I won't put you through all of it. You might say, well, I don't know, just after lunch. And then we'd say, well, where are you going to do? Well, I'm going to look online. Or, so you ask people to think about what, when, how. Just ask them the questions. Would this make a difference to how fast people get back to work? There's our control group. It's randomized across in one area, first of all. That's our treatment group. In other words, there's a really significant number extra who are off benefits at 13 weeks by simply asking a different set of questions. We take out everything we can, see if there's any other contaminating factors. We're still pretty sure we've got a 5% treatment effect. We then, by the way, just to make sure, we then take a region in the UK, and we do it in one region called a step wedge design. It's now across any job center in the UK, because that also worked. You'll go in, and you'll be asked this question in a different way. We've also replicated this in Australia and Singapore with even larger effects. Another example where markets operate, particularly consumer markets, a lot of our regulations and regulators, particularly in Britain anyway, would think about, well, this is a highly competitive market, we've got no market failure. But in a world of real humans, you have all kinds of other failures that occur, right, which are behaviorally based, even if the market looks it's like it's competitive. So a huge issue for us had been a massive political issue was energy bills. 
Doesn't sound very exciting. I know you have some issues here, but so we've got six major companies, a very competitive market on the face of it. Um, and yet, I could, if in any room in the UK, if we'd said to you, well, how many people have switched? Bearing in mind, you would save hundreds of pounds generally on average if you switched to another supplier. But typically, one in ten people in a room would say they've ever switched, right? So what's going on here? What's what's the problem with the market? Well, our concern was, and if I remember, um, I had to discuss this with the prime minister. So I thought, you know, that weekend before, I'll try and switch. Of course, I get my bill and I look at it and I think, well, I'll go to the switching site and so on. It turns out I need a number which is not on the bill. I have to call up my energy company to get this bill from the number they've got on their bill, you know, and so on and so on. You can imagine. It turns out quite difficult. There's extra friction in this market. So one response is you, and in fact, what happened in the UK, do you restrict the number of tariffs? So we found between these six companies, they had more than a thousand tariffs in the market, right? As far as one can tell. So you could reduce the number of tariffs, and that did happen. The alternative is, if friction is so important, and there was a discussion this morning about friction, some kinds of friction, not others, um, or could we do anything about it? So what we've done now, on your bill, there's a summary of your data in a QR code. So we're requiring energy companies to put a summary of your data. Why is that important? Because it means, with the help of a switching site, you can put your phone against that, and it will tell you in about two seconds, well, David, the best tariff for you would be the following. Would you like to switch? Oh, yeah, click here. Now, it's funny, the energy companies weren't too keen on this uh, change, it turned out. <laughs> but what I'm trying to show you is that using essentially a behavioral lens took us to a different kind of solution in terms of a market intervention. There are many markets that have got these characteristics. Your mobile phone, you may have literally millions of alternative tariff phone network combinations. That is well beyond what most consumers can handle. But we can redesign markets to make it for humans as opposed to econs. Here's another example. We had some broader issues and we talked about some macroeconomic models. But what's not in the models and what is? So here's a simple example. Do you think other people can be trusted? It's a very simple question. We've been asking it actually across countries since the uh, late 1950s. It's a rather complicated graph, but it shows you a composite of lots of that data. And you can see in general, this is levels of social trust in the um, kind of 1980s through to in more recent data. And you can see massive national differences. So on the one hand, we've got countries like Brazil and Turkey, where you'll be lucky if you can find, you know, one in 10 people would say most others could be trusted. On the other hand, we've got our Nordic neighbors up there who are ridiculously trustworthy. 60, 70% say most others can be trusted. And in the middle, you get countries like the UK and Germany. Interestingly, Germany's been drifting towards higher levels of social trust, a very good thing, and we've been drifting towards lower social trust. Now, should this be something in our models? It absolutely should be. If we put a variable, a simple variable, into a macroeconomic model to predict national economic growth rates, it's a better predictor of future growth rates than, for example, levels of human capital skills in an economy. It's hugely important for how our economy works. Imagine you live in a world where you don't think other people can be trusted. Put it the other way. Imagine you do live in a world you can be trusted. It means you share information. It flows through the economy well. It means you don't need a lawyer. Every time you transact, you can shake someone's hands. It means that when you're trying to decide who to employ in your company, you don't employ your uncle or your cousin, you go out to the market and you get the best person. It is phenomenally consequential for how an economy operates, and yet traditionally, we didn't have it anywhere near our models. There are lots of these kind of variables in our view, as Germany. We've also thought a little bit in a more fundamental way, which is that we often talk, when economics, we talk about utility maximizers. Well, are people any good at it, and what are they actually trying to maximize? So it's interesting, both in, um, in the UK and in Germany, both our, our leaders have been interested in the question of well-being. Fortunately, this is a measure of life satisfaction against GDP per capita. There's Germany, as you can see that, and there's a relationship. Fortunately, that's very good, isn't it? But you can see it's far from perfect. Actually, in this one, the UK does slightly better than Germany in life satisfaction, even though a very similar level of GDP. On the other hand, look at, look at these Danes. There's Denmark at the top here, ridiculously high levels of life satisfaction, and been getting higher for the last 30 years. There's obviously more going on here than GDP alone, because other things matter, like do you know your neighbors? In fact, do you think other people can be trusted? It affects not only economic growth, but your life satisfaction too. But these have often been shrouded, and indeed, at the micro level, people often are rather poor in their predictions. So we misremember what made us happy. You come back from your holiday and people say, did you have a good time? And you say, it was really lovely. 
But if you kept a diary, you'd be complaining about the kids have been shouting all day and it stopped, didn't stop raining and so on. But you get back home and you think, yeah, no, it was really nice. Um, so we misremember and we also mispredict. Right? So um, this micro as well as the, micro, the macro story is at play, even in relation to fundamental utility, utility issues. Um, OK, even if you don't care about the behavioral aspects, as I said, one of the things that the behavioral insight team has brought to British government, and now increasingly in many other places, is a kind of humility, experiment. So we are trying to build, we are building a series of institutions which are literally in the business of doing that. We've had one for a long time in medicine. When you go to your doctor and they say, well, we recommend the green pills today, it's not just because they prefer green as opposed to the red ones, they had some evidence for it. But when you get to other areas, like in education, why do we think our teachers are doing the best practice? Did they ever test it systematically? Remembering that we are all prone to so-called God complex, overconfidence. It's not just economists, it turns out, who are overconfident. We all are. Well, since 2011, we set up the Educational Endowment Fund, has run more than 100 large-scale randomized controlled trials across our schools involving more than half a million kids to try and figure out what actually what works. And it turned out lots of things we assumed worked don't really work very well at all. Teaching assistants, for example, we spend four billion a year in the UK on them. The evidence suggests they don't do very much. On the other hand, teaching kids an hour of philosophy a week improves their reading, writing, and maths at age 11 by the equivalent of an extra term of schooling. We're never going to find that out by sitting in an armchair. We're going to have to actually investigate it. We'll not go through it. We're doing the same in terms of early intervention, local growth, crime reduction, even aging issues. And we would love, of course, to work with other countries on this issue. And this is the kind of outputs they produce, just so you can see. This is from education. It's very simple. It's like trying to buy a dishwasher. This kind of intervention in general advances kids by this much. This is how much it tends to cost. And this is how confident we are in terms of that judgment, really importantly. So, in conclusion, well, in 2010, you'll be pleased to know that the British media was just as skeptical as I think the German media is today about the idea of behavioral insight in <laughs> the Chancery or in central government policy. It was all a bit of a joke. But what happened is, as I've just shown you a few of those results, as those results came in, um, opinions changed. They really changed quite dramatically in the media and perhaps more importantly in terms of how public servants and professionals also viewed the use of behavioral approaches. People were skeptical about the stuff in theory, but when presented with the practical results, we're actually quite persuaded. We now, of course, help many other countries, partly by request. That's why we changed our status to be able to do so. Um, but I'll just show you one example, because the question is, would this translate outside of a UK context? Just as we asked, of, would it translate out of a North American laboratory? I'll just show you one. So we were recently asked by the World Bank if we would help with tax collection in Guatemala. Now, for those of you who don't know Guatemala, it's what we have in the literature is called, it has very low tax morale. Um, I don't know what the German translation of that would be, but you might think Greece, um, if you want to get the idea. Um, so we had no idea as to whether techniques developed in the UK, like I just showed you on tax, would work in Guatemala. But I'll just show you the results. This is a control. This is then a letter. So first of all, we just tested, which actually Guatemala had never done, sending a letter to people who hadn't paid their tax. Um, then we rewrote it, in, actually in this case, in plain Spanish rather than English, and you can see a big uplift, and this is the amount paid per letter. Making reference to national pride, well, it's a good thing to do, made a little bit of a difference. Adding social norms, now, this is a complicated one, like I showed you in the, in the UK version, um, was incredibly powerful. In Guatemala that was complicated because we had to figure out, well, most people, you know, how many did pay their tax? It turned out that 62% of people eventually paid some of this tax. Now, you might not be very impressed with that, but in Guatemala, people were like, oh my God, 62% had a significant impact on increasing payment rates. And finally, people often like to cheat a little bit, but no overtly, I won't go into detail, so using something which is, we'll take this as deliberate at this point, has an even bigger impact. So huge effects. So in conclusion, we have found that using behavioral approaches, essentially trying to introduce a more realistic model, in very small process and details, is incredibly powerful and something traditionally neglected by governments, crazily, in our view. There's a question, again, in the German context as to whether constitutionally you can do such trials, but in policies, it leads to different kinds of solutions about how you regulate and how you think about how economies operate. And for those who want to go there, we think there are quite profound questions about deshrouding, revealing, helping people just be able to make better choices in terms of their life satisfaction in general. 
And wrapped around all of it is this essentially more empirical, more humble approach to policy making. So we've gone quite a long way since we started in 2010. This is my friend Richard Thaler, who has helped us often along the way. Um, and now today, not seven people, but pretty much 70 helping across the world. So I know you, in the German context, people are early on that journey, but I would encourage you to give your government a little bit of space to try these um, approaches, and you may find that they are surprisingly effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Please take Was a seat. Please, over there. Um, Peter Jung meinte gerade, um, dass Justus Hauptkapp den uh, Papierball nur gefangen hat, weil er auch mikroökonomisch arbeitet. Makroökonomen hätte ihn nicht gefangen. Ich, <lacht> den Test müssten wir noch machen.